So I'm Gary Danton and today we're going to be talking about facial fractures in the trauma setting. The goals of this presentation is to review how we provide clinically relevant radiology reports and ultimately group fractures into clinically relevant patterns. And this includes the frontal sinus fractures, NOE fractures or nasoorbital ethmoid fractures, isolated nasal bones, ZMC fractures or zygomatico-maxillary complex fractures, isolated maxillary fractures, we'll talk about orbital wall fractures and Lefort fractures, we'll go over some practice cases. One thing about how we construct these reports right off the bat, I, I like to uh, list the fractures and then classify them in the impression. And the reason I do this is because I've spoken to clinical colleagues at my institution and I've asked them what they like and this is what they told me they like to see and the reason they like this is because they will look at the images and make a list of fractures that they see and if I have a very simple list one after another they can go down their list and compare it to my list and make sure that they've seen everything if I have all the fractures listed in a big paragraph it makes it harder for them so for example I might dictate anterior wall frontal sinus paragraph, posterior wall frontal sinus, comminuted with multiple fracture fragments, maximum of five millimeter displacement, something like that. So let's go on and talk about it. So the importance of facial fractures in part has to do with the involvement of the buttresses. So the facial buttresses is the harder bone within the facial bones and the muscles attached to these areas and pull on these areas and this is what gives the face its ability to function including things like the muscles of mastication. So if any of these buttresses are fractured they need to be repaired in order to maintain the structural integrity of the face. So let's talk, go to the frontal sinus. In frontal sinus fractures you want to talk about is the anterior wall fractured or the posterior wall or both. Comment on the comminution and the degree of displacement. If the posterior wall is fractured look for things like pneumocephalus and dural violation, degree of bone loss because the posterior wall is part of the calvarium and any violation has neurosurgical implications particularly if there's pneumocephalus or dural violation. Also with frontal sinus fractures, you want to keep an eye on this region called the nasofrontal duct. If the nasofrontal duct is fractured and becomes obstructed, then the frontal sinus isn't able to drain and you increase the risk of complications such as a mucocele, mucopiocele, osteomyelitis, and this can go into the cranial vault and cause epidural or subdural abscesses. So here are some NPRs and 3D reconstruction showing you the location of the nasofrontal duct which you can see here goes into the hiatus semilunaris. So if the anterior table of the frontal sinus is fractured and it's not displaced they typically do not need surgery. If it is displaced fracture they may choose to do surgery for cosmetic repair. If the posterior table is fractured it's a little bit controversial but frequently these will be surgically repaired. If it's non-displaced they may choose close follow-up. If there's signs of violation which extends into the cranial vault then uh, they may require neurosurgery. Some of the surgeries that you can do include sinus obliterization or cranialization. We don't see a lot of sinus obliteration so I borrowed a case from the literature. Here you have an A, a fracture of the anterior and posterior walls of the frontal sinus. In B you have repair and what they've done is they've packed that cavity with fat and they stripped the mucosa and the arrows in C show that they blocked the nasofrontal ducts. So you might say well gee you block the nasofrontal ducts you have all these complications but if you remove the mucosa then you don't necessarily have that concern because you're not producing mucus so there's not a drainage problem. The other surgery which we do see more of at our institution is cranialization and so in this case for example the entire posterior wall of the frontal sinus was removed, the mucosa was stripped and it's replaced with uh, fat and essentially it becomes part of the anterior cranial vault. Now we're going to talk about nasal bone fractures and in this case
it is not a nasal bone fracture. This is actually the frontal process of the maxilla. Now, if you accidentally call it nasal bones, it's really not a big deal. I've spoken to our plastic surgeons and OMFS people, and sometimes they'll refer to all of these fractures as nasal bone fractures, but technically this is not the nasal bone. The nasal bone are these two bones which are most anterior. This is the frontal process of the maxilla, and here you have your nasomaxillary groove, but these are the nasal bones. And again, the nasomaxillary suture, this is the nasofrontal suture, nasal bone, frontal process of maxilla. On these 3D images, you can see this illustrated as well. Again, frontal process of maxilla, frontal process of maxilla. Here's your nasal bones, nasal bones. So when you have fractures of this region, which includes the area around the nasal bone, these can be classified as nasoorbital ethmoid fractures, or NOE fractures. And here you have fractures of ethmoid sinuses, the nasal septum, and these regions which go through that medial vertical buttress. Here in this illustration, you can see this region, and there's a buttress which runs right in this area, repaired if it's fractured. Again, here's the nasal bones. One of the issues with fractures in this region is you can have injury to the insertion of the medial canthus tendon, and this tendon controls the eyelid. And if the fracture of this region is highly comminuted, then they may need to reattach that medial canthus tendon. And here you can see different mechanisms of plating these uh, buttresses. So there is a classification system of these fractures, and it really relates to how comminuted this area is. It's called the Markowitz classification. I really don't classify things in my reports like this, but it's important to keep in mind to describe how comminuted this region is because it affects how easy or difficult it might be to reattach this tendon. And here are some 3D reconstructed images and NPRs showing you where that medial canthus tendon inserts. I like to use 3D reconstructions to best illustrate different fractures. And you can see this would be a type 1 Markowitz with this big fracture fragment here. And there will be no problem with the insertion of the medial canthus tendon. Here's an illustration of a type 1 Markowitz. This might be a type 2 with a big fragment where you don't have to reattach the tendon itself, but you just reattach the segment of bone and you restore function of the tendon. If it's highly comminuted, however, you might have to do more complex repairs to attach the tendon. So next we're going to talk about fractures of this region, and this is where you have fractures of the zygomaticotemporal suture, zygomaticomaxillary, zygomaticofrontal, and zygomaticosphenoid. This is your ZMC fracture. This used to be called a tripod fracture, but there are four components. So now it may be referred to as a quadrupod fracture. So let's go over this again on the coronal and axial images. So here you have zygomaticomaxillary, zygomaticosphenoid, zygomaticofrontal, zygomaticotemporal. And again, here, this is zygomaticomaxillary. So when you report ZMC fractures, you may want to talk about the range of injuries, degree of displacement and comminution, and whether or not the orbit is involved. And you're going to particularly look at the medial wall and lateral walls of the orbits. Now, with orbital fractures, which we're going to talk about, you always want to pay attention to the orbital apex, because if there's a fracture of the orbital apex, then that can impinge on the optic nerve. You want to describe with orbital fractures if it's an isolated blowout fracture or part of a larger fracture pattern. You may want to comment on the shape of the extraocular muscles and if they're herniated. Comment and look for the orbital rim to see if that's involved. And if that's involved, it's not an orbital blowout, it's a blow-in. Identify all the walls and also look for fat or soft tissue displacement. Here's your classic mechanism. You have increased pressure within the orbit and a weak wall breaks, which is usually the orbital floor, but it doesn't have to be. Entrapment is a clinical diagnosis.
So here's two examples of orbital fractures and which is the most likely to be entrapped. Well actually the top is the most likely to be entrapped because the way entrapment usually or most commonly occurs is the bone breaks, snaps back together, catches the fascia, and then keeps the inferior rectus muscle from moving. When there's a big defect and even if the muscle is herniated as it is here, it may not make a difference because the muscle can still move freely. So here's three examples where the extraocular muscle, the inferior rectus, looks abnormal. It has a rounded appearance instead of this normal horizontal appearance. This one was entrapped. This one was not entrapped. And this one was not entrapped, but they said there was limited superduction. So by CT, it's really hard to tell if there's entrapment. And usually, there's no entrapment. When you talk to the ophthalmologists, they'll say that the radiologists are always suggesting entrapment. But in adults in particular, there's rarely ever entrapment. In kids with these trapdoor type fractures, which is what it's called when that bone breaks and snaps back together, it's much more common. Even here, there was no entrapment. And you can see this muscle is pretty much wrapped around the fractured orbital floor. You can have other types of blowout fractures involving the roof, involving the medial walls of the orbits as well. Now we're going to talk about Lefort fractures. Lefort fractures seem complex, but they're actually very simple. Pure Lefort fractures, however, are pretty unusual, and oftentimes they're part of more complex fracture patterns and may not fit into the classic pattern. So a type 1 Lefort occurs when you have fractures through the maxilla, which ultimately leads to the separation of this part of the face from the remainder of the face. This is a type 1 Lefort. If your fracture pattern is such where this segment of bone can be removed from the face, you have a type 2. If this segment of bone can be removed, it's a type 3. So how do you diagnose this? So first, you're going to look to see if the pterygoid plates are intact or fractured. They have to be fractured for it to be a Lefort. Then you look at the pterygomaxillary junction. It should be fractured. So there should be pterygomaxillary disjunction. And then you look for the key indicators, which is you classify the fracture. A type 1 has a fracture through the lateral piriform aperture, type 2 through the inferior orbital rim and zygomatico-maxillary suture, and type 3 involves the zygomatic arch and lateral orbital wall. And I refer you to this paper by Ray and Novelin, and it gives the simplest method of diagnosing Lefort fractures. So here you go. Bilateral pterygoid plates are fractured. Step one. Next, look at the pterygomaxillary junction, fractured bilaterally. So now we're going to look at our key indicators. Fracture through the piriform aperture, we have a type 1. Fracture through the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus into the orbital rim, and then across the nasal bridge, we have a type 2. Zygomatic arch is involved bilaterally, and across the nasal bridge, we have a type 3. So I would read this as bilateral type 1, 2, and 3 Lefort fractures. The reason I classify it as type 1, 2, and 3 is because if I said this was only a 3, I'd be ignoring the fractures here and here, and these go through buttresses. So these need to be repaired. You can't just repair the 3 pattern, you have to repair the 1, 2, and 3 pattern. It is possible to have a unilateral Lefort, but there must be a fracture through the hard palate, separating the side with the Lefort. So it's a bit unusual to have that. A little bit about mandible fractures. So they are classified by the location in which the fracture occurs. If you have one mandible fracture, be highly suspicious. There's often a second. And a fracture right through the middle here would be a symphyseal fracture. This would be parasymphyseal fracture, fracture through the body of the mandible, 
fracture through the angle of the mandible, the ramus, the coronoid process, a subcondylar fracture, and a condylar fracture. And this is how you'll describe them. <laughs>